Congratulations this afternoon. Greetings, uh, everyone. Thank so you for joining us. We are just waiting for started. a couple more of our, our, um, <clears throat> our panelists and hosts to join us here. So I just want to say hello, um, um, welcome, and I invite you to share your name and where you're coming from um, or any early questions for this panel in the chat. And we will get this going very soon. Kazembe, I don't want to um, jumpstart any of the discussion or, you know, get too far ahead while we're st while we're waiting for Brandy to join us. But I, I thought maybe um, you could introduce yourself and share a little bit about your work. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm Kazembe Murphy Jackson. Um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I'm 41 years old. <laughs> and yeah, I have been organizing for about a decade around, um, you know, police brutality, um, reproductive justice, um, just liberation for Black people in general. Um, and yeah, right now I work with a group um, called The Rising Majority, and I'm also a member of uh, We Testify, and it's a group of storytellers that um, have had abortions that believe that it's important for us to tell our stories. Um, yeah. So that's who I am. Can you tell me why, um, or more about the importance of telling these stories, um, to tell your story, but also to tell the stories of your community and neighbors? Um, what impact is that having in your organization reach um, in your community? Yeah, I would say um, that I'll speak about We Testify, since that's how I got here, um, is we really, I think, you know, one thing I didn't say when I was introducing myself is that I'm a trans person. And so, um, also I use he, him pronouns. And um, I think it's important. I don't hear a lot of trans men talking about abortions and I have a lot of trans men friends who I know get abortions. Um, and I want, I just want to be telling my story so that other people like me will know that they can get an abortion and you know, that there is somebody who went through a similar situation that they're going through. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important for, that's why it's important for me. Um, and I think if you asked a different storyteller, you'd get a different answer because um, everybody does it for um, their own reason, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think we testify and other reproductive justice um, organizations are changing the narrative on abortion. Um, and I think we change it by telling our stories. One of the one of the slogans that we often say is everybody loves somebody who had an abortion. And you all know that if we're not out telling our stories. Mm -hmm. Hi, Brandy. Hey, Brandy. Can't hear you just yet. We're gonna get there. Cause Mbe, um, I, I saw Mia Kim Sullivan put in the um, chat just now. You know, she clearly knows your work, um, and that you filed an um, amicus brief in Mississippi. Is that right? Is that um, is that recent work that you've done? I realize that wasn't me. Okay. That's some storytellers in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. that did that. 
that did that work. I'm very proud of it, but I can't claim yeah. it. <laughs> I can't claim it for myself. Yeah, great to see that yeah, work. Justify is it's run by uh, Renee Bracy Sherman, who is just um, amazing and very supportive, and really kind of holds us um, almost like a family. Um, to be supporting each other because a lot of these stories are not easy to tell. I'll tell you, mine is not easy for me or the people who hear it, um, but I think it's necessary. Randy's picture is so glamorous. It is. <laughs> And so have you been working with Brandy um, on any of the work, well, Brandy and NCRP um, on these pieces of work, the storytelling, but also the advocacy, the organizing? I haven't, I'd like to. Um, <laughs> I haven't though. Uh, this is my introduction into um, their work specifically. I've been having conversations well, like, that's actually uh, some with Randy oh, how are you? And, I was like, we'll say hello. and we're friends so you know um we've done a lot of movement work together but I haven't worked with her in this capacity until today and so I'm excited about that Great, I'm hoping she can join us soon. I, I see know. we have um, we have over 20 people here. And so why don't we just do a big reverse here? What questions do we want to surface in the next hour? Um, where would we like to you know, make sure that our fantastic panelists are able to dig into um, areas in particular that are of interest to your, the, the work that you're doing or just the, the next edge of learning um, that you're trying to bring forward? <laughs> Kazembe, where um, where do you tell your stories? Oh. Who's publishing these stories? Where are we able to find these stories? How do we make sure those that need to hear these stories and be you know um, be a part of the community are able to to find them? And um, yeah, I tell my story in a lot of different places. Um, sometimes it's uh, people who are writing articles about abortions. A lot of the times it's um, writing, really trying to bring out the perspective of men having abortions. Because um, I identify as a man and I had an abortion and there's a lot of other people like that. Um, I think um, and even men's abortion stories, right? Cause men have abortion stories too. Like even if they're not the ones that had the abortion. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I tell, so you could Google me really. And, <laughs> and that's all that comes up. So it's like <laughs> rewire or, um, Say it in Spanish too. <laughs> like rewire or um, um, who are some of the other places? GQ uh, did an article. Um, That's really interesting that those publications in particular, like I think that that is a really interesting indicator of, of the interest and the focus. I mean, Wired and GQ are, um, not where I would have imagined, perhaps. Um, they would be introducing their audience clearly to some of these. Mm -hmm. And then Rewire, I think Rewire does a lot of um, uh, work around reproductive justice. Not work, but like publications and stuff like that. But yeah, GQ was a shock because um, it was like, 
wanting to include men. It was a Father's Day thing or something yeah. like that. But um, I also speak at rallies and, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I definitely heard wired, not rewired. So I apologize. Oh, yeah. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was like, no. Nah. Um, but um, yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. I tell it wherever I'm asked um, to be. Really, I'm I'm there. Now I know that in philanthropy we are, you know quite interested in storytelling. We're really interested in hearing from the folks on the on the ground or most impacted. And have you um, and your colleagues found that philanthropy is ready to embrace these conversations? Where are you seeing some um, intersection between the way that funders are operating um, either on the local or national level internationally? Um, mm -hmm. Um, and engaging in the work that you are doing. Yeah, I think that's a little bit of a tricky question, but I can try to answer it. Um, I think as a trans person, I could say that a lot of trans um, led organizations um, that really are providing um, like meeting people's material needs and um uh and when i say material needs i mean like giving money to people to get abortions um but are not necessarily listed as an abortion fund um but it's really hard for organizations like that to get funding um uh i know of two in particular um there's snapco in atlanta and then there's Brave Space Alliance in Chicago that basically if anybody comes in and says they need the money for something, it doesn't matter if it's for abortion, but if it is for abortion, they will help them pay for it. And so organizations like that, I think, need to be funded more. Mm -hmm. I know need to be funded more because um, I'm a monthly sustainer to some of them. Um, and I think I think it's important um, because like, yeah, this definition of who gets abortions and who needs funding for abortions has to be up, upgraded or mm -hmm. upgraded. Um, mm -hmm. there, there, there's a wider range. People are getting more familiar with the gender spectrum. And so there's a lot of gender expansive people who don't necessarily identify as men, but also who don't identify as women. And they need abortion care too. Um, and so you would be able to reach those people by funding trans-led trans organizations in general. I think it's how you reach them. Yeah, and I, you know, I do see some questions in the chat here. Um, from your experience as a storyteller, do you have any best practices to share with advocacy groups mm -hmm. and grant makers that support storytellers' autonomy and power? Thank you, Mia Kim. Where did you see that question? So it's in the q and I was looking in the chat, and then I was like, wait a minute. Oh, it's in the q &A. This audience is savvy. They're going to the q and okay. Yeah. <laughs> Keep me on my toes. Um, <laughs> when you experience a storyteller, do you have best practices to share with advocacy groups, grant makers? Yeah, I think one of the things is um, letting people tell their. Oh no, you just muted. Oh, I got muted somehow. Um, um, so I think you may be able to unmute if you can mute me. Um, I did not mute you, but I will go and I will you play around with it. it. <laughs> Someone did, I didn't click the button. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would say some of my best practices that I would share with advocacy groups and grant makers 
that support the autonomy of storytellers and uh and power yeah is letting people tell their stories um for themselves encourage that um and i think as far as best other best practices um like i said i don't i'm not an expert in philanthropy but what i understand is that there are people who get a lot more funding than other people mm -hmm. i would think yeah i'd say um translate organizations but also like abortion funds and other people who are actually meeting the direct um material needs of people uh need to be funded as much as we would fund any any other um like gender justice group Right, so not just funding for this specifically, but but operational funding, funding for the organizations that are looking at the broader picture of how they're supporting trans people um, and the broad, the spectrum of gender. Yeah, and not just trans people, but I, I keep saying trans people because I want trans people to be included in this conversation. Mm -hmm. But I know there's other people who get abortions too. A lot of them are women and um, those places need those those um abortion funds clinics they need to be funded too um mm -hmm. so um and i think this other question where it says this is maggie may says what's the role of storytelling in trans philanthropy i think it's the same same thing that i was talking about like letting people tell letting people tell their own stories um, for themselves and listening to, mm -hmm. to their stories, um, doing things like this where, where you're having conversations with people and letting them tell you what they need um, instead of assuming, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. And making sure and feeling and not perhaps trying to find the story that fits into the narrative you are trying to mm -hmm. create, um, fit your narrative around the actual experience. Um, thank you, Maggie. And Nico um, asks, I'm curious how other reproductive services for trans folks fit into the conversation about abortion. Mm -hmm. Such as hormone replacement therapy is what that. Uh, thank you. Abbreviation is, um, thank you for that question i think that other repro services for chance to fit well i would say a lot of the times we we get the services at the same places um as as a trans masculine person i would say um yeah i'm very visibly queer i have queer tattoos all over me so when I go into a place, I want to feel comfortable that like um, that there won't be like Bible verses and stuff like that put in my face to make me think that I'm doing something wrong. And that's true for abortion, but that's also true for hormone, hormone replacement therapy um, because both of, I would say both of those things in my own experience have saved my life, the abortion and hormone replacement therapy. And so, um, but it has to be places where we're comfortable going and not just where we're comfortable going, but where the staff is trained, that's what they need the funding for. The, the staff needs to be trained um to be able to deal with trans and gender non-conforming people gender expensive people um but also uh yeah it's just we go where where we feel like we fit in 
And I think we get a lot of our services from places who offer abortions, um, but that's not the only service that they have. Um, I know a lot of people who get hormone replacement therapy from Planned Parenthood. So, you know, but they get a lot of funding. <laughs> so, I mean, compared to <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> little organizations that are paying for people's abortions. But yeah, not as much as like these big corporations. So don't get me started there. There has been a, a very, well, very long campaign, if you think about since 1973, but, you know, at least 10 to 15 years, a campaign to bring about some of the most restrictive abortion laws in across the states. You know, I think there's like 30 right now that are, you know, ready with terrible laws as soon as things change for Roe um, <clears throat> when the Supreme Court makes a decision. Um, and, you know, really just playing that long game. And a lot of folks have really woken up since um, Texas's SB8. Yeah. Um, and I think we're really starting to to note how how bad it's going to get. And, and I don't see in mainstream or even philanthropic um, news sources where we are not just talking about women getting abortions. Um, really not seeing this story about how, you know, there's, it's, it's terrible how far people are now having to travel, um, mm -hmm. how many can't do that. Um, and we are, but we're just talking about women. And so I would think that <clears throat> the services might be even more specialized in some cases, you'd really need to, um, that the care is harder to find perhaps for people seeking abortions that are not women, even harder. Um, how has your community um, been working on this or um, not just doing storytelling, um, but really sort of digging into what does this mean for? Yeah, I mean, even before, um, uh, I don't, I couldn't even tell you the, the time that this began, but queer people and trans people have been taking care of ourselves for a long time because we weren't being taken care of. And so I think um, that there is a, like when I, when I got my abortion, it was $300 um, and I had to get a payday loan to get it. So it ended up being about a thousand after the interest from the payday loan. I was in college and I was broke. And um, I just think now there are systems in place, even without funding, trans people are just creative where they figure out how to get um, the money to people. I'm sure in Texas, I don't, I don't know for sure. I had my abortion in Texas a long time ago, um, but I'm sure that people are finding ways if they have to, to get out of the state or, um, you know, whatever it takes to be able to get their abortions because there's so many reproductive justice organizations that, that, under, that understand that people's material needs need to be met and so they're doing that. They're doing that work. People are doing it officially as a part of an organization. People are doing it unofficially too. It's like, this is my homegirl down the street um, uh, that needs this service. Um, so how do we figure out how to get it for her? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's a little of both. Yeah. Um, I, I I received a question over chat, so I'm going to ask, ask it. So I have some friends yeah. in the audience, clearly, that are also maybe having trouble accessing the, um, the chat. Um, and they're curious about something that your org is organization is doing that feels especially unique or groundbreaking, but really like what the essential work that this audience needs to know about. Mm -hmm. I think we justify um, Outside of storytelling, it we testify is a storytelling organization. But outside of that, like one, 
we support each other. But a lot of the people who are in We Justify are um, abortion doulas or um, um, uh, clinic escort. Um, we all donate to abortion funds. And so, which is how a lot of people are getting abortions now is through the abortion funds. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's all I'll say. I'm like, is there something else to say? I don't know. Yeah, and I think um, for some of us that are not as familiar with the, the work that you're doing and, and maybe the funding in trans communities, specifically, you know, in the, the place. Um, so for some of our, or the organizations that are here that are very local, you know, accessing um, the ways in which to be supportive, you know, the ways that they can show up for these communities in their, in their regions of service. Um, and, oh, I see Brandy. <laughs> I saw her go off mute and then go back on mute. Oh, we almost had her. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell me, what is exciting you about your work right now? What is, what are you seeing? Where is the 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 hope? I want to say, but also, where where is the where do you see the positive movement um, that? this community can get behind and and help bring forward or well I think all throughout the South, I'm a Southerner and so I speak to what I know and I know what the organizing is looking like in the South. And like yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of black women led organizations. There's a lot of um, queer and trans led organizations that are um, that have a lot of hope, but have a lot of anger. And I think the, hang the anger drives the hope, if that makes sense, <laughs> because mm -hmm. they're, they're really upset that, and I'm upset. Um, you know, there's many days that I sit back and think like, what if I wouldn't have been able to have my abortion? Like, right. what would my life be like? And I feel I feel bad for the people in Texas, and a lot of people feel bad for the people in Texas. And, and we know at this moment that that's not enough. Right, it's not enough to just be angry. Um, and so people are people are. Um, there's a uh, a oh, that's not public. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but there, there, there is fighting that's happening. There's fighting. Like we're not just saying, okay, well, y'all didn't rule on this, and so now that's the law, and we just are gonna deal with it. We're not gonna deal with it, and we're putting pressure on the decision makers, um, not just for Texas, but like you said, it's multiple. Um, horrible abortion laws that are coming up because mm -hmm. they've been planning for this month. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of work that's happening in the South with groups like Sister Song, um, uh, Sister Reach, <laughs> all these sisters. And that's one of the things is that a lot of these organizations, even though they are trans friendly, are the names keep trans people from them. And that's why I was suggesting really? that if you want to get two trans people, donate to the trans organizations because mm -hmm. um, that's where trans people are going, where they're comfortable. Right. Can you tell me something about that language? What language? 
the language that feels um, exclusionary and prevents somebody oh, yeah. from, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like a lot of the a lot of the groups have sister or woman um, mm -hmm. in the title, mm -hmm. and it makes it feel like since they didn't say trans people somewhere in there or something like that, um, that maybe trans people are not welcome there. Right. Uh, and so rather right. than take the risk, you go somewhere where you know you're welcome. Like for me, when I, when I, and maybe because we're running out of time, <laughs> oh. right here, I might need to start um, telling y'all my abortion story so you can actually have it. But, um, oh, were you going to do that today? I was going to do that. Thank you. Let's finish up this question. I would, and then, then I would love to hear that. Sure. So, um, yeah, that's why I was saying donate directly to trans led mm -hmm. organizations because they're the ones that are meeting the material needs of trans people. Um, there you are. Brandy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. If y'all knew what I just had to go through, I am so sorry, but I now it's I have okay. an app on my phone. That's all right. Me and Megan are best friends now. We are. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> but we, we have missed you, Brandy. Um, so, and yes, your point is very well taken to, um, to continue to fund where the community can access. Um, oh no, she's she's muted again. Um, okay. I get that. I get that. <laughs> um, so, um, thank you so much. Um, it's been really lovely talking to you. And and Brandy, um, Kazimba was about to share her story, uh, but naturally, I want to let you two to take this forward. Um, thank you again. And I'll just be watching from the backstage. I appreciate y'all. Kazembe, hey fam, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. I am sorry that that was so chaotic. <laughs> but um, I'm here. You're here. We got, you know, much less time than originally planned. But I know that you were saying all the things and getting the people together, which is why I always appreciate you. Also, <laughs> I will say I'm very excited. For us to be in this space together because you're my kindred from the front lines and it's always yeah. great to be with familiar people in my work over here in philanthropy so yeah well not same i don't work in philanthropy but same <laughs> Listen. i'll be in this space with you <laughs> um so i'm sure you did an introduction of yourself mm -hmm. okay i'm going to do a very quick one okay um, so, hey, folks, I apologize for the tech issues. Um, this is my first day in the office ever, and everything that went wrong, went that could have gone wrong, went wrong. Um, but my name is Brandy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a Black queer mama from the South, um, reproductive justice organizer that has somehow made my way over into philanthropic organizing, working with the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy, holding work as the senior movement engagement associate, focused on work that censors reproductive access and gendered violence, um, particularly through our movement investment project, and just making sure the philanthropy that philanthropy as a sector is accountable to issues such as abortion access, birth justice, um, trans survival, sex work, and all of the great things that oftentimes get left out of the conversation and don't get a seat at the table. Um, and I'm really, really excited, as I stated, because Zimbe is somebody that I have worked with in other spaces. He is somebody I consider kindred, and I'm very thankful to share space with um, both here and outside of here. And NCRP has been working um, for well over a year now on abortion access in the sector, having conversations with folks on the front lines. And a part of that looks like, um, well, from the NCRP side of things, doing research, evaluating data, seeing how people are funding these things um, and noticing the trends and the gaps that the sector has created in regards to access and equity. And we've been having a lot of conversations with abortion funds, abortion storytellers, mm -hmm. and other folks just in regards to what they've experienced at the hands of philanthropy. And we've been reporting that out through a roadmap 
um, that has four different sections. The first section has come out that focuses on abortion providers and clinics. The next part really focuses on transgender and gender expansive access. And we were really excited to have this conversation with the Women's Funding um, Network and its members because you all are the folks that the sector essentially pivots to to break the stigma and remove the shame around abortion. And even in the spaces and the opportunities that are there for women's foundations to do that, oftentimes it gets blurred as abortion, um, especially in philanthropic feminist spaces, are looked at as a women-centered. And when I say women, I mean very much so a cis women-centered, um, oftentimes a white women, white cis women-centered um, issue. So very excited um, to be able to have this conversation with y'all and also be very transparent and honest that, you know, the folks who hold this work and are the experts are the folks closest to the pain and the harm. Um, and that is why abortion storytelling is so essential and so important and why NCRP has been really adamant to make sure that storytellers are in any spaces that we in, that we are in regarding abortion. Um, I do just want to ground us real quick because I'm because you still have not told your story, correct? Nope, I was waiting. Okay. <laughs> um, I do want to ground this real quick um, as we pre prepare for Kazembe's abortion story. Um, this is a story that I have heard before. Others might have. As I know, I think I heard at one point when I was in and out that Kazembe stated has been, you know, told in different spaces that folks have access to. But I do want to ground this in just everyone sitting still and paying attention to themselves, how they receive things, how they hear things. Um, because a part of abortion storytelling is the truth. And sometimes the truth is hard. It can be triggering. It can be painful. And I just want folks to be prepared to sit in that and hear the truth um, and be able to be fully present. So with that being said, Kazembe, I appreciate you for sharing your story in this space. And I'm going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, yeah. Uh, I'm glad Brandy kind of gave that warning because this is a little, it's a lot triggering for me. Um, and it may be triggering for you. Um, so do what you need to do to take care of yourself. But I do hope y'all listen because it is hard to, hard to say. And that's why I'm delaying, but here I go. Um, <laughs> so my junior year in college, um, I'm just jumping right in. Uh, um, I was working late at the library. It was it was finals week or dead week, whatever they called it. And everybody was at the library. And I stayed later than anybody in my dorm. Um, and so I ended up walking home by myself around one o'clock. Long story short, um, I ended up getting uh, raped by four different men and beat up and kind of left in the um, yeah, that was a lot. Um, ended up getting left in the grass between my dorm and a museum and uh, The reason the people did go to, they, they went, to, my politic was very different around police and abolition and, and jail and stuff then because I was like 20 um, and didn't know a, about like um, restorative justice or anything like that. And, I, and the police were called and um, we went to trial and um, they got about six months each um, because I asked them to wear a condom um, and the judge said that was given consent. But about a month later, I found out I was pregnant um, a month later after it happened. And, you know, I was in college, I was broke, I was scared. I was depressed from what had happened because um, a lot of it was around like them saying, well, 
you know, God doesn't want you to be gay, that kind of stuff, because I was clearly gay and masculine then too. And what do I want to say? So like, I think Yeah, I was I was in a really bad place. Definitely suicidal and definitely just extremely depressed and couldn't see what my future would look like going forward. I knew my family is very missionary Baptist. Um and if you don't know what that means, that means they are very very uh, devoted to their pastors and what their pastors believe. And my mom's pastor at the time believed that abortion was wrong. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to tell her, but I didn't have anybody else to take me to the clinic. So I had to. And, you know, I would say that my abortion itself, everybody has a different experience with how their abortion goes. Mine was not that great of an experience. Um, It was hard. And, you know, there were the normal people lined up outside. Um, This was in 2001. So it was the, the era for people just sitting outside the abortion clinics. And I think what else I'll say is that, you know, in my story is all of these horrible things that people did to other people. But what was also um, bad about the experience is that um, Yeah, like when I got to the clinic, they were like, who's getting the abortion? <laughs> like, is it you or is it somebody else? Because like, as if a trans masculine person didn't have reproductive organs. <laughs> and so it really made me feel like dehumanized a little bit. But... um I always say that my abortion saved my life because I did go to that Planned Parenthood um, because that's all I knew. Um, I took out a payday loan to pay for my abortion. So it ended up costing me more like $1,000 than $300. And um, what else do I want to say? I'm sorry, for some some reason, um, telling my story is a little harder today. Um, but yeah, the, I'm gonna just breathe for a minute. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I need to catch myself again. Please breathe. Time is, this is your story in your space. Yeah, I just think that my abortion saved my life because I was suicidal. And I did tell the people at the, at the Planned Parenthood that I was suicidal. And the lady called the Rape Crisis Center for me um, and set up an appointment did all the like registration stuff for me and you know really made sure I had a ride and everything to get there which is way above and beyond what they have to do and I find with most people who work in abortion care um they typically go above and beyond what they have to do because they're really passionate about this work. Um, 
But yeah, had I not gone, I I had I not gone to the rape crisis center, I don't know what would have happened. And I think that telling my story in particular is important. Um, sometimes I don't like to include the rape part because for some people, that's the only excusable time that you can have an abortion. And I don't feel like that's true. I feel like whatever reason the person who got pregnant has <clears throat> that makes them want to have an abortion that they should be supported in that decision. And, um, and I get a lot of slack because my story is so horrible, but like, yeah, there are people who are happy about their abortions too. And I think Is there anything else I want to say about that? I think I'm going to stop there. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Um, before I get into anything else, I do want to say thank you. And I appreciate you um, for holding this space and telling your story and being as present as you can be in this very, very this very, very, um, I will say as someone who has held this work and it has my stories and it's, it's not easy and it can be, you know, there are days where this topic and this discussion flows and it can feel like healing. And there are days where you can't tell the whole story and it doesn't feel like hearing healing. It feels like um, for a lack of better words, shit. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I, um, as somebody who often holds the work also of that argument of it's not always trauma and it's not always hard, that narrative erases the truth for so many people. Um, and that that is part of the the narrative shifting and the the control that that happens that makes it really hard to share stories to access abortions to do the work um and a lot of that comes back to what we're here to talk about so i'm going to one let me check in with you how are you feeling right now i'm okay okay thank you um always um I'm going to transition back into the conversation of how philanthropy can step in to shift these things. Um, so through the conversations that NCERP has had, um, I will be very clear and transparent that in regards to this specific part of the abortion conversation, NCRP has relied almost pri primarily on the stories of storytellers. Um, one, because the data is not there. And a part of that is because people do not get paid for the data. And it's an issue that people don't often look for data around. They think that there's enough data around women getting abortions and that that is the collective or the majority, which is another erasure. Um, so through that, no, NCRP does not have a lot of data to back this up. But what I stand in also when speaking to funders is that these people are not data points, especially people that are seeking abortion services. One second, my phone's about to die. Especially people that are seeking abortion services. Um, these are people's lives. These are people's experiences. Um, <laughs> And I say that because the data that goes with that makes it very clear. Um, philanthropy primarily funds the rights part of this. They fund the policy, they fund the legislation. 
Um, and a lot of that is because of the way that the narrative has been shifted. There's this idea that as long as Roe exists, as long as abortion bans are not in place, abortion is safe and it's accessible, which we know is not true. And storytellers remind us that consistently. Um, the sector overly funds abortion work at the national level when the work and the hurt is happening at the state and local level. Um, you cannot have a, a very, a real or a true impact if you're not giving money to the people who are holding the work at the margin. And I know we're getting close and I, I want there to be a window for time um, for folks who have questions. So I will only just, I'll read off the call. Well, not, I don't like to say call, call to action. It's more demands. Um, call of action, call to action sounds optional. Demands are not. Um, for women's foundations in particular, what it looks like to fund this, um, prioritize care at the margins. You all cannot continue to fund abortion care and abortion access um, through this very cis hetero lens that's been happening. You have to fund trans focused research. Um, you know, stories, like I said, are the are the 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 part that people need to hear. But as long as the focus is only on what's historically been the idea of who gets abortion, you're gonna continue to erase folks and you're gonna continue to erase access. Apply a gender inclusive lens and language to your grant making. Um, I am someone who feels that, you know, language and those things are a step and not a push. But when, you know, like I said earlier, philanthropy is looking at women's foundations, health foundations in particular, to be the ones to shift the stigma, shift the narrative. Um, hold your existing grantees accountable. If they are not making sure that the services they provide, that the care they provide is trans inclusive and gender affirming, you hold them to that. Philanthropy has a history of holding their grantees to a lot of things, but this kind of accountability is necessary for folks' survival and elevate and follow the trans leadership that are having these conversations. I know some folks got on here and were familiar with Kazembe. If you're funding abortion and you do not follow any trans or gender expansive people who have had abortions, then you are not following or elevating the right people. And, you know, there's a, a larger conversation that has to be had around what it really looks like to have the conversation of where class and capitalism impacts trans folks and the hold that philanthropy has on that. And if you're going to be funding abortion access, that is a part of the conversation that you all have to be a part of. Um, so I tend to ramble, Kazembe, is there anything that you would add <laughs> to what I just said? No, I think what you said is very similar to what uh, I said while we were waiting for you. <laughs> so great minds think alike. Always. But no, I don't think I have anything to add uh, to that. Okay. So I do see with the lack of data, hard data that philanthropy typically expects when it comes to trans equity, the field can consider stories themselves to be data. Yes. The stories are the data. And that's part of so a part of the roadmap series that NCRP is releasing, each part has a story to go with it. So with the portion that just came out around abortion clinics and abortion providers, we have a storyteller who's telling her story around what it looked like to have to travel because there were no clinics to access where she lived. We have um, a story that goes for the portion of the roadmap that discusses transgender and gender expansive access and care. The other two moving parts um, that will come out later this year and early in 2022 um, is a portion that focuses on abortion funds. And there's a storyteller um, that explains that without an abortion fund, there would have been no abortion. Um, and the last one um, is one that we're working on around crisis pregnancy centers and the role that philanthropy plays in perpetuating the harm and coercion that they, that they um, cause in this space. And there's a storyteller telling her story around um, the experience she had with the crisis pregnancy center and the impact that it had on her accessing her abortion. Um, so for us, because that data isn't there and because the data also doesn't tell their truth the way that their stories do, 
we've relied a lot on storytellers. Um, we Testify has been pivotal in my healing and my work. Um, and I try really hard to make sure that storytellers and We Testify in particular are centered in conversations around abortion because that's what philanthropy has been doing for years. It's been having either conversations without people in the room who have had abortions or silencing the people in the room who have had abortions or making the room so uncomfortable that somebody who had an abortion couldn't say that they had one. Um, and what NCRP is really hoping to do is shift that. The sector is in a space where people shouldn't be able to say, hey, I had an abortion. It shouldn't be a space where people can't explain what led to their abortion or a space that requires people to. But a space with this much access and proximity to power and money and privilege is required to do something. And that something is not is to not be silent in particular. Um, it is 457 and we are very close to time. If anybody has any other questions they wanna throw in the chat real quick, we got three minutes. Other than that, I might spend these three minutes loving on my, my Kendrick because I appreciate him. Cause you dope. <laughs> You're dope. <laughs> Hi, and thank you for being patient with me. I wish you could have seen me running through this office grabbing different iPads and laptops <laughs> and phones. <laughs> I saw how many times you came on and went off. <laughs> we were trying. We called IT. We called all kinds of folks. So, but I got here. I got here. here, and I'm glad we got to have this conversation. I am too. Uh, and Megan, Megan did good in your in your absence, holding it down. Off the I'm top sure of Megan is amazing. WFN has some really dope folks on staff, which is why. And I'll say this: there aren't too many spaces where I would have proposed to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and WFN and its members are one where I felt comfortable. Nice. Um because we both know these conversations can be received and held in a lot of different ways. Yes. Um, and I'm never going to put people I love or myself or the work that we share <laughs> on the line just to say we said something. Mm -hmm. um, so WFN is definitely a space that I trust and I'm thankful that we were able to hold this conversation. And folks, I don't know if you can see the chat because then babe, but folks are loving on you with appreciation and thank I you. I appreciate y'all. Yeah. All right, y'all. Y'all are amazing. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and enjoys what's the hour and a half that is left of the conference. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>